Those of you lucky enough to have listened to it will know that we spent the whole of episode one on the first three weeks of Hugh's stay at the sanatorium up in the mountains. But buckle up, because the next three weeks are only going to take us two minutes. Good morning, Mr Castle. How are we today? Good morning, nurse. Because Hugh is spending them confined to bed on doctor's orders. Good morning, Mr Castle. Morning, nurse. We are playing with time. Good morning. Morning. Coffee? Uh, yes, please, nurse. Someone brings you your morning coffee? Morning. They brought you it yesterday, and they'll bring it again tomorrow. Morning. Coffee? Yes, please, nurse. And for a moment, as they pour, you feel almost dizzy. Coffee? Please. Because lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, your tenses have got all confused. Past, present and future all blend together. Coffee? Please. Fortunately, James pops in regularly. Hello. Oh, hi. How are you? 99.5 degrees. He sits with you several times a day. 99.7. To ask how he is. 99.6. And pass on news of all the little goings-on in the daily life of the sanatorium. But Hugh's questions are always the same. Has anyone left? No. Hugh asks this about ten times a day. And... is anyone leaving? No. Until James seems to get quite impatient. No. No one's leaving. He answers Hugh's repeated questions with his eyes on the floor. No, no one. Until he decides to settle the matter once and for all. No, no one's leaving, and no one's planning on leaving either. I have it on good authority. If they were, I'd let you know. What are they talking about? Or, should I say, who? Every evening as Hugh lies in bed watching the light fade, a vision of Madame Claudia Civet floats before him. Her cheekbones, her slanted eyes, her arms, her mouth. Terror, fear, hope, joy, nameless dread, boundless uncertainty, total extravagance, all press upon his young heart, so that he puts a hand to his chest and whispers to himself in the darkness, My God! Hello? Oh, oh forgive me. Uh, Professor Jones. I have disturbed your meditations. No. Uh, please, sit down. I was just... Oh, thank you. Thank you. How are you? How are you feeling? Not up and about yet? My cold's nearly gone, but my temperature's still high. So you let them examine you? I had a fever. If I'd been back home, I would have gone to the doctor. <laughs> and how many months has our good doctor sentenced you to? I asked you that once before, do you remember? Yes, you, you called him something funny. The, uh, the king of the underworld, I think. <laughs> Did I so? <laughs> once upon a time, there was a woman who came up here, spends months here, doesn't feel any better, feels much worse, loses weight, faints, can no longer walk, and till, they say, oh, it has begun to look as if the climate doesn't agree with you. <laughs> She's beside herself. Why didn't they tell her that before? Now they've ruined her health entirely, hmm? Well, let's hope she felt better when she got home. Well, they haven't said anything to me yet. I might have an X-ray. An X-ray? Marvellous. Then they'll show you spots and shadows and say they know all about you. But these things are open to interpretation. You can't just follow the science. It's not that simple. Once upon a time, there was a chap up here. They treated him. He died at last, and an autopsy showed there was nothing wrong with his lungs at all. He didn't have it. He had some bacterial infection. It's a bit soon to be talking of autopsies. I don't think I'm that far along. <laughs> Touché. <laughs> you're a wag, Brother Hugh. And you're a sceptic. Do you believe what they say about your insides? Ah. Do you have spots and shadows? Yes, I do. Unfortunately, I am rather ill. Um, I'm sorry. What about your studies? Oh, I don't need to worry about that. They'll keep my place if I... And forgive me, what about money? 
That's no problem. Your folk are wealthy? Yes. I was very young when I lost my parents. And my grandfather, who looked after me, he died too. So naturally, I don't think of myself as so hard-headed as, as some people. <laughs> you mean your repeated contacts with death make you sensitive to the thoughtless cruelties of the world? Yes, it's exactly. No. I know that's... What? No. Let me tell you something. Let me lay it upon your heart. The only healthy and noble way to regard death is as part of life. You must not separate it from life or set it up in opposition to life, or play it off against life in some disgusting fashion. I, I, I don't quite understand. The ancients decorated their sarcophagi with symbols of life and procreation, some of them quite obscene. They knew how to honor death as the cradle of life, the womb of renewal. If you separate death from life, it becomes grotesque, a wraith, a ghoul, a vampire. As an independent spiritual power, death is depraved. Its evil charms are strong and they can cause the most abominable confusion in a susceptible mind. Don't sulk. I'm, I'm not. You think I'm lecturing you? <laughs> you are lecturing me. Oh! You've got a visitor. Well, I was just leaving. Oh, uh, don't go. Professor Jones has been improving my mind. <laughs> if only. Well, that's very kind. Well, that's what I said. He's been persuading me to think about going home. Very good. But his conversation is so interesting, it just makes me want to stay. <laughs> <laughs> You're a wag, Brother Hugh. Good evening to you both. Good evening, Professor. What was that about? He wants to teach me. Good for him. What have you been doing? Oh, they asked me to play bridge. Did you? It wasn't bridge at all. I won £25. <laughs> <laughs> How time flies. One morning, Dr Cromarsh comes by on his rounds, as he does every day. And what was it in the evening? Uh, after supper, it went up 2.7. Mm. Apart from that? Oh, the same. Just the same. Mm. Good. What? What is it? Well, it's been three weeks. Has it? It's three weeks today. Good Lord, how it flies. Seems like only a couple of minutes to me. So, can I... Oh, I arise and walk, Mr Kerstorp. <sighs> Rejoin the throng, but then I go mad. Eh? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, don't look at me like that. You think if you hadn't said anything, I'd just have left you lying there till doomsday? No. Well, the next step's to take a look at your interior with our X-ray specs. Yes. We'll do it as quick as you like. Uh, tomorrow morning, yes? Yeah, thank you. That evening, Hugh resumes his place at the dinner table, accepts friendly greetings from his neighbours, and waits for the door to slam. In comes Madame Civet, slouching to her seat. But when she sits, she turns and looks straight at him and smiles. My God. See? <laughs> We've all missed you. Ah, Miss Robinson, how are you? No worse, thank you. Mr Castorp, I have news for you. Yes? While the cat's away. <laughs> I'm sorry? She's been entertaining. What? He's French, like her. He's staying down in the village. He takes tea with her every afternoon. Oh, you, you don't say. A young man. I haven't seen him, but they say young and handsome. Well, I never... And that's not all. You know she's been having her portrait painted. What? Didn't you know? Everyone knows. No. Posing for someone right here in our house. A who? Dr. Cromarsh. He's been seeing her twice a day for an artistic examination. Oh. Well, everyone knows he dabbles. Mm. I presume it's not too artistic, you know? No. Life study. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> naked. 
do you think? Oh, oh, that wouldn't be right, would it? No. Oh, well, you know. Hmm. That night, when he goes to bed, Hugh's temperature has gone up to 99.9. Next morning, he and James are sitting in the waiting room outside the X-ray suite. James has agreed to keep him company, and it's just as well, because they are joined in due course by the next patient on the schedule. Oh, good morning. Oh, good morning, Madam Civet. Morning. She sits down. <sighs> James gives Hugh a quick glance, picks up a magazine, and hides behind it. Hugh's face has gone red. <coughs> Excuse me? Yes? Um... Madame Claudia Civet is addressing her remarks exclusively to James, despite the fact that his face is still hidden behind his magazine. Mm. Do you mind me asking, for what time is your appointment? Half past. I am quarter two, and a person just went in? A little while ago. They're running late. About ten minutes, I think. That is not pleasant. No. We've been here fifteen minutes. I see. Yes. Hugh's heart is pounding. <clears throat> he doesn't resent the fact that she is speaking only to James, because it seems to him that she is making it clear that she is aware of the circumstances. <sighs> And if pretty little Marjorie were here instead, he knows that he would chat with her, while James would blush and stammer and perhaps stare at Marjorie's legs, as he is now staring at... The whole slender outline of her long legs, one crossed lightly over the other under the blue fabric of her skirt. She's going to be x-rayed. He's painting her outside, and now he's going to look at her insides too. Oh, dear. <sighs> Next! Ah, Castor and Pollux both, is it? In you come. Sorry to keep you, Madam Civet. Will not be long. Thank you. Welcome to the Sorcerer's Lair. Kindly suppress your screams of pain as much as is reasonably practicable. Now, shut off please, Mr Castor. Oh, yes. Sorry. We have to keep it very dark in here so that the eye adjusts. And then we can see you right through you. Nervous? No. No need to be. Our images are all in the best possible taste. James, aren't you due another sitting? Yes, Doctor. Let's have you as well then, shall we? Off with your shirt. Yes, Doctor. So, Mr Cashthorpe, you sit right up to the apparatus. Oh, yes. That's it. All you need to do is hold the panel, press your chest against it, and clutch it to your bosom. Imagine it's whispering sweet nothings in your shell-like lug hole. And, uh... <clears throat> yeah, right. Okay, now, keep absolutely still. Good. Breathe deep. And hold that breath. Smile. Say cheese. No, don't say anything. Just keep still. There. Done. You can relax. Thank you. Do you want to see the results? Uh, yes, please. I'll wait a moment and the brazen head will disgorge. James, your turn, I think, will pop you under the fluoroscope. You know the drill? Yes, Doctor. <clears throat> Mr. Castorp, if you stand next to me, you'll see your cousin's insides. <laughs> James, do you mind? Please, be my guest. Ready? Yes, Doctor. Put your eye here. And that's it. Ah. A nice clear image. That's the slim military laddie for you. I like some of the gut buckets I've had in here. I'll try peering through their flab. <laughs> Did you see that shadow there? Yes. That's the pleurisy he had when he was 15. And what's that? What? Uh, that. That's his heart. Oh my gosh. James. Yes? <laughs> I can see your heart. Can you? Sorry. Oh no, feel free. It's beating. Good to hear. Like a sort of flapping jellyfish. Super. In a moment, when the Sybil utters and the image is printed, you'll be able to see a transparent postcard of your own insides. Would you like that? I think so. 
But when Hugh gazes at his own picture and sees his delicately turned bones as if stripped clean of flesh, for the first time in his life, he understands. I'm going to die. Someday, I'm going to die. Creepy, isn't it? As they are ushered out, Madame Sivid enters the laboratory after them. Hugh lies propped on his lounger, writing a letter. Dear Great Uncle Joseph. He is writing on the sanatorium stationery. It's probably a good thing I came here to see Cousin James. He's wrapped in his camel hair blanket. If I hadn't, quite by chance, gone along with James to have an examination, I would never have found out about my own condition. And it's soon done. With much love, Hugh. With this letter signed, he thinks to himself, well, what does he think? Freedom. As the word forms in his mind, his heart pounds, and a wave of terror and excitement sweeps over him. It's a feeling he's getting to know quite well. Freedom. Hugh watches Claudia Sivet. He watches her slinking in and letting the door slam, slouching in her chair, biting her nails. He's always hated people who bite their nails, but now he tries it himself, just to see what it's like. One day, coming into supper, he lets the door slam behind him. That felt... okay. He slouches in his chair. <laughs> Puts much less strain on the abdominal muscles. It's evening. And the curtains have been drawn across the broad dining room windows. But there's a gap somewhere, and a shaft of the dazzling red sunset shines through it right onto Madame Civet's head, so that she unconsciously puts up her hand to shield her slanted eyes. From across the room, Hugh notices this and traces the ray of light to the gap in the curtains. Oh. Mm. He's got up without saying a word. <gasps> What's he doing? He's working his way between the tables to the curtains. Excuse me. He's closing the gap. Oh. Madame Civet, mm. feeling the sudden benefit, mm -hmm. turns round and gives him a friendly nod of thanks. He responds with a bow, his heart mm. pounding. And now he's going back to his place. Only one or two people have noticed... James stares down at his plate, but Miss Robinson catches her neighbour's eye, and they both suppress a giggle. <laughs> ah, waiting for dispatches, youngster. Professor Jones. Yes, of course. Join the queue. It's Sunday, and on Sunday, mail is not delivered to the rooms, so everyone has to gather in the lobby after lunch if they want to pick up their letters and cards. My cousin's checking for us now. So I see. Hugh comes just for the chance to rub shoulders with the object of his desire. He stands around with a forlorn and passionate smile on his silly face, trying to catch Claudia Sivet's eye in the crowd. How are you? Mm -hmm. How is your acclimatisation progressing? Uh, not brilliantly. I think I might have to get used to not getting used to it. Oh, nicely put. But of course, youth is capable of anything. You are staying with us, then? But just for the winter, until James is ready to leave. Just the winter? What about your affairs at home? Oh, I've written to my family and sent for some warm clothes. Or perhaps you'd be buying a fur-lined sleeping bag. I might. It's only a few months. Ma'am, Vach, the way you throw the months around, there is a continental laxness to it. In France, they may order these things differently, but here, time is a gift of the gods, given to us so that we may use it in the service of human progress. Young man, do not linger too long on Circe's island. Do not Odysseus. If you're not careful, before you know it, you'll be down on all fours, grunting. Oh, really? So, what should I do? What I told you before. What, leave? You mean I should go home? I told you on your very first evening here. The doctor has said that if I go home now, he won't be responsible. I will. 
What? I will take full responsibility for sending you home. But you're not going. You're staying here. My illness is much worse than yours. Besides, I can work here. I am a man of letters. I can write here every day, and I do. I will rage against the spirit of my disease to my last dying breath. I cling to the spirit. You are following the dictates of the body. Uh, what do you have against the body? You're a humanist. Aren't you? Humans have bodies. But there is one force, one principle for me above all, and that is the mind. The body is nature, and nature as an opposing force to reason is evil, mystical and evil. Did you know that the great Plotinus is on record as saying that he was ashamed to have a body? I can't say I did. When the body serves the cause of happiness, of freedom, of the senses, then I respect it. But when it represents the principle of disease, of death, of perversity, lust and disgrace, I despise it. Oh, hello, Professor. Oh. Ah. Goodbye, Professor. What was that about? Not much. What have we got? Just a couple of postcards. Nothing for you. Sorry. Well, if it isn't Damon and Pythias. Afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Doctor. Damon and Pythias. Getting some vitamin D? Very good. Highly recommended. Oh, you paint, don't you, Doctor? What gives you that impression? Oh, I've heard a rumour. Is it true? After a fashion, yes. Landscapes? Landscapes, still lives, animals. Well, I stop at nothing. Portraits? Yeah, now and again. Would you like to commission one? I'd love to see your work, wouldn't we? Oh, yes. Really? Yes, of course. You can have a look now, if you like. I'll make you lads some coffee. Oh, we'd love that, wouldn't we, James? Absolutely. Oh... I know that face, don't I? You recognise her? It's... Uh, Madame Civet, isn't it? Yes. Ah. Oh. Yes, I see. It's Madame Civet. What do you think? Do you think it's a good likeness? Oh, definitely. Yes. Really good. Wonderful. Really good. The nose was quite tricky. And those eyes. Those cheekbones. Do you know her? Uh, a little. Only the way one knows people here. I know all about her insides, her blood pressure, her lymph circulation, but the surface is a different proposition. You ever notice the way she walks? Uh, no. She's a slinker, and her face is just like her walk. <laughs> Interesting. You see the skin just here on the breast? Uh, yes. Do you think it's lifelike? <sighs> You're terribly. I don't think I've ever seen more lifelike skin than that. Uh, as I say, I know what goes on underneath. That helps. The sebaceous gland, the mm. lymph glands, blood vessels. Then the layer of fat, foundation of the gorgeous female form. <laughs> and then, of course, what a man thinks and imagines. That has to go into the mix. Yes, that's so important. And it does help to see nature from another angle, from the medical point of view. Mm -hmm. Well, medical science is concerned with human beings, isn't it? Aye. And so is everything else. Law, theology, uh, art, they're all concerned with human beings. It's amazing the way that every profession is grounded in the same form, the same idea of beauty. Intellect and beauty, science and art, they all bend together. Don't you think you should hang it opposite the window? The light's much better there. Shall we sit down? I'd love some coffee. Uh, of course, uh, it's brewed. Uh, let me pour. <laughs> Curious coffee cups. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> Interesting design, isn't it? Remarkable what those little figures are getting up to when you look closely. Uh, they were a gift from a patient, uh, an Egyptian princess, who graced us with her presence for one brief year. Does it bother you? It's intended for bachelors like us. No, not at all. Obscenity has its place, doesn't it? <laughs> Apparently the ancients decorated their coffins with images like this. The obscene and the sacred, one and the same. Uh, I think the princess was more inclined to the former. I'd love to hear more about the lymph circulation. Uh, are you interested in physiology? Very much. Sometimes I think I could be a medical student. Or a clergyman. Why? But then, why are you studying 
engineering, is it? Oh, purely by chance, external circumstances. It's a family firm, you know. But I'd love to know more about anatomy. I- I've ordered some books. Have you? Well, we'll take the lymph now. Lymph is the most refined, intimate and delicate mechanism in the human body. Breast milk is formed from the lymph, collected from the legs and the abdomen. Breast milk... Mm. Lymph of the legs. It's so interesting. I could definitely have been a medical student. I wonder if the we flesh, should... the human body. What? Uh, what's it made of? A bit of protein, various elements, but water mostly. Well, then, in the end, we just evaporate. Sort of. Everything resolves into simpler chemical compounds. What, decomposition is just a kind of burning off. <laughs> That's right. Oxidization. And life too. Life is oxidisation. The oxidisation of cell protein. Aye, that's where our animal warmth comes from. Some people have a bit too much. So, if you're interested in life, then it's death you're particularly interested in. Uh, There's a bit of a difference. Life means that the form is retained. Why? Why retain the form? Why? Delicious coffee. Isn't it, Hugh? Doctor, I'm sure we've taken up enough of your time, haven't we, Hugh? We 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 really must be going. We've, We've got our rescuer. Haven't we, Hugh? Uh, yes. Thank you, Doctor. Come on, Hugh. Time for a lie down, I think. Hugh has bought his fur-lined sleeping bag, and he lies out in it on dark evenings when a huge wintry moon shines down on the valley below with a little electric reading lamp and a glass of brandy by his side. Alone with his thoughts and the glittering vista, he meditates. He has invented a name for this habit. He calls it... King of the Castle. Hugh plays at King of the Castle with a textbook propped on his stomach. He has been reading poetry, Shakespeare, Homer and Keats. But just now he's studying anatomy, physiology and biology, reading with burning interest about life and its sacred, impure mystery. What is life? It is warmth. It is not matter. It is not spirit. It is somewhere between the two. A bloated concoction of water, protein, salts and fats with its network of nerves, veins, arteries and lymph glands takes shape, runs riot, achieves form, beauty, the quintessence of sensuality and desire. (sighs) I'll have to think about that for a minute. A vision of life hovers above him in the frosty air, above the glistening valley. A white body, leaning back, wrapped in an aura of its own vapours. Gazing down on him from under lowered lids, the eyes have a slanted look. The mouth pouts, smiling at him. What is life? What is life? Is it perhaps only an infectious disease of matter, a cancerous stimulation of the immaterial? Is life the first step towards evil, towards lust and death, just as disease in an organism is the intoxication, enhancement and crude accentuation of its own corporeality? His eyes pause at the bottom of the page. Looking out into the darkness, he marvels at this vision of life. Her voluptuous limbs, her fleshly beauty. She spreads her arms, revealing the inner surfaces, the tender skin at the elbow. She bends down over him. He senses her organic aroma. He feels a warm and tender embrace. Mm, Hugh. Yes. Melting with lust and dismay, he lays his hands on her cool upper arms and feels the moist pressure of her kiss on his young lips. Mm, Hugh. Yes. Mm. Of water. Oh, this looks lovely. Yeah. Some more. It's not so pleasing. <laughs> My neighbour has died. What? My neighbour down the hall, a, a businessman ran some corporation. I heard him coughing when he first arrived, and he sounded pretty ill then. Do you mind? Trying to eat my chicken? But he's died. I... Didn't Nanny teach Mr. Rude any manners? We don't talk about that. We don't discuss it over roast lunch. But you can't pretend that you don't Shut think... up. There are people here in the same boat could go off any day. We don't talk about it. But you it. can't just ignore it. Of course we can. Button it. Hugh is outraged by this attitude and decides to rebel. He asks the nurse if he might pay his respects to the departed and persuades James to go with him. 
They are given permission to join the widow for a short while in her vigil at the bedside of the departed oligarch. It's very kind of you. Young people have such busy lives. Well, not at the moment. And, uh, and we wanted to, didn't we? Yes. Hmm. I lost both my parents when I was young. I'm no stranger to a deathbed, and after all, we are both ill. <clears throat> but I am sure you will recover. You both look so well. What do you do down in the world? For me? I'm at Cadet College. A soldier? Yes. You will have to get used to the sight of death. Yes. Yes, I will. And you, Mr. Castorpe? I, I was training to work in transport technology, but... Uh, but... Uh, I, I, I don't know how long I'll be staying here. This is a crucial time in my life, perhaps a turning point. And one can't know for sure. Hmm. When James hears Hugh say this, he turns and stares at his cousin in silent horror. Fortunately, the widow doesn't notice. That was the right thing to do. She was pleased. There can be something dignified about death, can't there? Professor Jones wouldn't agree. Wouldn't he? We should do more of this. What? We are living right next door to people who are suffering, dying. We should show more concern. And so it is that Hugh and James become known in the sanatorium as Good Samaritans. How long is it since Hugh got off the train to join his cousin up here? It's been seven whole months. Fancy that! We've come to the end of October. It's Halloween! The management has made a tremendous effort with the decorations. Pumpkin lanterns and flickering skull-shaped candles, fake cobwebs, streamers, rubber bats dangling over red-shaded lamps. Many of the patients are in fancy dress. Marjorie's mother orders the first bottle of champagne, and Marjorie does the honours. Mr. Castle, may I pour you a glass? You may, and please call me Hugh. All right. What about you? James? Thank you very much. <laughs> Many more bottles follow. Champagne cocktails are mixed. And Hugh drinks one or two. Look at Stow's costume. White coats with black horizontal lines. What is that supposed to be? A thermometer. <laughs> if you want me to take your temperature, all you have to do is pop me in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Professor, pull up a chair. Thank you. I have a champagne cocktail. Oh, no, not for me, thank you. Look, lad, do you see? What? Lilith. Who? Oh, you mean Adam Civet? Who's Lilith? Adam's first wife, before Eve. Adam was married twice. So the story goes, Lilith became a wraith who haunts young men by night. <laughs> but you're here to keep us safe. Are you, Dylan? Oh, 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 we're on first name terms now, are we? It's Halloween. <laughs> All is topsy turvy. Well, health and long life to you, Dylan. <laughs> What's going on? What's Crowmarsh up to? It's a party game. Come on. In the middle of the lobby, with his white coat topped off by a large red fez, Dr. Crowmarsh has set up a silly little parlour game and gathered his audience round a table. Now, paper and pens are all you need. Now watch carefully, folks, this is how you do it. Do what? I put pen to paper, I close my eyes, mm -hmm. and without peeping, I draw. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the outline of a pink. Easy. Oh, you think it's easy, Mr. Stower. Well, you try. Right. Now, the outline of a wee piggy, that's all. I shot, tight shot. Doesn't have to be a continuous line. I shot. It's a monster. It's a monster. Not as easy as it looks, is it? I want another girl. Oh, come on. No, no, no. Oh, one at a time. Right. Mama Q, please, ladies and gentlemen. 
No one has much luck. Perhaps because it's harder than it looks. Perhaps because by now they're all very drunk. Hugh blames his pencil. Oh, oh no. <laughs> rubbish! <laughs> No, it doesn't count then. This pencil is rubbish. I want another go. Now, how can I draw with this stump of a pencil? I have to try again with a decent pencil. Uh, a proper one. Who's got a pencil? Does anyone, ha does anyone have a spare pencil? Do you have a pencil, perhaps, Madam Simmet? Me? Yes, you. Are you so desperate? <laughs> yes. I have a little silver pencil in my bag. Somewhere. Here it is. <laughs> I knew you'd have one. Take care of it. Il est un peu fragile. It is on. Propelling. You twist and out it comes. See? Ah, yes. Uh, come on then. Where? Come and draw. <laughs> but that game is over. Is it? People have lost interest. Look. They're drifting away. There's going to be dancing. Would you want to dance? Would you like to? <laughs> well, I'd do it if that's what you want. Not very galon. So, oh, sorry, I didn't mean it like that. Then, um, shall we sit? It's quiet over here. If you like. Well, you take the chaise long, I'll pull up this little chair. Very well. I really like your dress. Thank you. It's new, I think. <laughs> you seem very familiar with the inside of my wardrobe. <laughs> I'm right, though, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're dancing. Or would you like to? No, thank you. They will get in trouble. If Dr. Cromash comes, he will send them all to bed. <laughs> Why have you waited so long to speak? What good are words? In eternity, people won't speak at all. You know, it'll be like drawing that little pig. You'll turn your head away and close your eyes. You are a curious little dreamer. <laughs> and I if we had spoken before, I wouldn't have been able to call you Claudia. What makes you think you can now? <laughs> All things are permitted in my dream. I'm afraid you won't have such freedom for much longer. Why not? I'm leaving. No. You're joking. No. I'm perfectly serious. When? Tomorrow. Where? Where, where, where will you... <laughs> Far away. Back to France? Perhaps. For a while. Uh, you're cured? Mm, no, but the doctor says I may risk a little change of air. Um, will, will, will you be coming back? Perhaps, sometime. I love my freedom more than anything. You don't know what it is to be obsessed with independence. And, and, and your uh, husband is happy with your independence. It is my illness which gives me my liberty. This is my third visit here. My case is complicated. I may return, but by then you would be far away. Do you think so? Why didn't you speak before this? Would you have liked that? No, no. This is about you. Was there someone who prevented you from speaking? Well, not unless you count Professor Jones. That old man is ill too. 
as ill as your cousin. It's, it's true then, James is ill. He shouldn't go back to his soldiering. He might die. The idea of death doesn't frighten me today. Why not? Because I am in love. Uh, you, you spoke to him once in the waiting room outside the x-rays. I recall. Vaguely. Uh, you were x-rayed too. Of course. Do you have a copy? In my room. I carry mine with me. Would you like to look? Oh, not just now. I don't expect as much to see. I've seen the portrait of your outside, but I would much prefer to see the interior portrait you keep in your room, Claudia. <laughs> Talking of, of your room, what about the young man who is invited there for tea in the afternoons? Oh, you're well informed, aren't you? Well, who is he? <laughs> he is a countryman of mine from the same district. I met him at another place like this some years ago. <laughs> He is ill, like me. Oh, why does he come to see you? Oh, we smoke gitan and talk about home and all sorts of things. We discuss um, philosophy, God, life, morality. Oh, he is and has always only been a friend. He is married and he is in fact uh, a homosexual. <laughs> is that enough for you? So, uh, what discoveries have you made about morality? You really want to know? Yes, I do. Very well. Some think that morality lies in uh, reason, discipline, good behavior. I would say just the opposite. It lies in... Um, in sin, in abandoning yourself to danger, in losing yourself. The great moralists were never virtuous. They were adventurers in evil. Great sinners who teach us how to stoop to misery. <laughs> oh, what? What is it? <laughs> the party's over. Everyone's going to bed. It's getting late, Claudia. Mm. No more first names. I will call you Claudia until the day I die. No more formality for me. Like morality, I want the opposite. Do you? What you say about morality, do you think it comes as a surprise? <laughs> do you think I'm an idiot? Perhaps. <laughs> what sort of idiot am I? Um, what do you think of me? You're a nice boy. You'll go back down to normal life and be a useful member of society and forget your dreams up here. And my temperature, my beating heart. They will subside. No, they won't because they came from my love for you. My love which overwhelmed me the moment I laid eyes on you. You are mad. Oh, what is love if not madness? I have always loved you. I recognised you a long time ago when I was just a schoolboy. I asked you for a pencil. And the spots and shadows on my portrait are proof of old scars. I, 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 I loved you even then. This is a fantasy. <laughs> you are my dream. My destiny. My eternal desire. Mm, poor little boy. Do you love me so much? <laughs> the body, love, death, they are all the same. The, the, the body is sickness and depravity. It produces death. Both love and death are carnal. 
that is the source of their terror and their magic. Death is shameful, but it is also uh, majestic, solemn, eternal, sacred. And, and the body and love of the body, that is shameful. We blush because we are ashamed, but at the same time, yeah, it is a miracle of uh, form and, and beauty. The human form, a ravishing beauty made of organic matter, full of the, the feverish secret of life and decay. Consider the marvellous symmetry of the human body. The shoulders, the hips, the breasts, the network of veins and arteries, the sweet inner surfaces of the elbow and knee, a zone of caresses. Let me kiss the back of your knee. The inside of your thigh. You know how to talk to a girl, don't you? Claudia. You can let go of my hand. Party's over. You better take your temperature tonight. I predict a significant rise. By the way, Hugh. Yes? Don't forget to return my pencil. I think you know which is my room. <laughs> Time for bed. Six weeks have passed since Halloween. Six weeks since Hugh went to Claudia's room and returned much later to his own, carrying in his pocket a little X-ray image. You have to hold it up to the light to see what is on it. A portrait of Claudia's insides, without a face, but revealing the tender framework of her upper body, delicately swathed in the soft, ghost-like forms of her flesh. Six weeks. How often has he looked at it and pressed it to his lips since then? And just as Claudia Civet predicted, Hugh's temperature has taken a turn for the worse. His fever is high, and Dr. Crowmarsh has decided to give him antitoxin injections to try to bring it down. Twice a week, Hugh reports to the surgery. Check it off and roll up your sleeve, please, Mr. Castorp. Uh, which arm? Which one was it last time? Uh, right. And then left, please. I was wondering we'll soon if have you... you back to rights, and then you'll be bidding us a fond farewell in a month or two, I shouldn't wonder. James says that he is... Your cousin happy. is not responding quite so well. But this doesn't stop him pestering me to give him his marching orders. When he wants to rejoin his regiment. Well, he's a swashbuckling action hero, but you're a sensible chap. You should try and talk some sense to him before he does something stupid. I do, whenever he brings it up, which is all the time, but he doesn't listen. And, and people are constantly leaving, aren't they? There was that lady a few weeks ago, the, the French lady, hmm? Madame Civet, just took off for uh, uh, France. Hmm. You painted a portrait, didn't you? We came and looked at it. it was wonderful the way you handled the skin. I didn't really know her then. Hold still, please. I only got to know her better just before she left. Really? At the very last minute, we just got chatting and sort of clicked. Oh, Ow! Sorry. Uh, Was that a nerve? Shit! Bad luck. Rub it better. Yes. So, you got chatting. Yes, and then she had to go. I thought it would be nice to stay in touch if there was an address, if you had perhaps a forwarding address. Oh, that... no, sorry. Why did she suggest? No, 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 no. It was all very last minute. She's sure to come back. Sooner or later, some people leave and then they come back. Some people stay until they're better and then they don't have to come back. 
So if I stayed on I am not force... talking about you. I'm talking about your cousin. He won't last long down there. You can tell him I said so. Yes, Doctor. I've had enough of this. I'm not going to be messed around like this anymore. Oh, Jamesy. He's got his knickerbockers in a twist. You can't go swanning around when they've told you to isolate. Do you think I like it here? Do you think I go around saying boo to gooses, do you? You just have to be a good boy. I'm going home if it kills me. Hugh doesn't say anything. His conscience is bothering him. He knows that James knows about a certain incident at Halloween concerning a propelling pencil and Hugh's very late return to his room, but they never speak about it. Oh, you can smell spring, can't you? No. This snow's never going to melt. Of course, it feels like that up here. Down there, the seasons go round and it feels right. The rhythm of the cosmos, the natural order. Whatever. But up here, where the snow lies so late, of course it doesn't feel like that. Everything feels a bit out of joint. Thanks for that, Hugh. Thanks for getting that clear for us. So it just feels wrong, and so it puts you in a bad mood, but it will change. No, this is bullshit. The whole thing is bullshit. James. James slams off in a huff, and there are tears in his dark, gentle eyes. Poor Hugh turns pale with fright. Why is he so frightened? He could do it. He's man enough, he could go. But he is ill. He might die. Could he leave me alone up here? When I just came up to visit him and now, maybe he's going and leaving me up here on my own. Ridiculous. Horrible. If I stay behind up here on my own, then I'll be here forever because I'll never find my way down without him. Hugh and James are having their regular checkup together when it happens. I'm nearly with you, Mr. Kerstop. Yes, Doctor. Just turn around, please, Mr. Simpson. Yes. Thank you. One last deep breath in and out, please. Thank you. So, Mr. Simpson, chin up. You're better than you were when you first arrived. Really? I can show you the records to prove it. So, another six months and Dr. You'll, be, you'll be leading the Light Brigade into the Valley of Death. Just give it Dr. a... Dr. Cromarsh, I'm leaving. What? I'm going to rejoin my regiment. What's this? Mutiny? I've been here for a year and a half. You told me three months and I'm still not well. Is that my fault? I can't wait any longer. I can't wait for a total cure. I have to go. And you don't care about the risk you're taking? No. Fine. Go. Dismiss. I wash my hands of you. It's a fresh air profession, killing people. Maybe you'll be all right. Yes. What about the civilian? I suppose you want to go too. Me? Yes, you, Mr. Castor. Uh, well, I'd, I'd rather wait for you to give permission, Doctor. Fine. You can go. What? But am I better? Oh, as good as. I don't know what's causing your temperature, but maybe it's not a little virus, so you can go. You're not serious. Not serious? Why the hell wouldn't I be? What do you think this place is for? I'm a doctor, not a pimp, and if you think any different, you can go and take a flying one. Get your clothes on and get out of my sight. All commanding officers lose it now and then. You just have to let it wash over you. That was dreadful. He's upset about that business about Mary Nolting and the man with the enormous moustache, obviously. I've never seen a doctor like that before. It had nothing to do with us. Did you see how he backed down when I stood up to him? I'm free to go. Hugh goes to lie down on his splendidly comfortable lounger, as is his now long-settled habit and looks out from his balcony across the snowbound valley to the peaks, the summits, the mountain ridges, sparkling against the deep blue of the sky. He is alone with his thoughts again, playing his favourite game. King of the castle. His thoughts wander. And just now he's thinking... James. James is leaving. And will you go on living up here after he's gone? Or will you leave? <sighs> no. Impossible. Why? Because things are different for me. I'm a civilian. 
James's duty is down there, but I have so much to think about. And I'm waiting for Claudia. I am thinking about so many things up here. You are king of the castle. Yes. And it makes you happy. <sighs> Wildly happy. James? Yes? You'll never guess. What? I'm a hundred and two. <laughs> That's as high as it's ever been. What are you? Uh, I don't know. I dropped my thermometer. I'm afraid it's broken. Hugh goes back to see Dr Crowmarsh and states that he would rather wait until he is completely cured. The doctor accepts this. James says nothing. And anyway, he's busy packing, paying his bill, saying his farewells, and at last letting his cousin accompany him to the station. Here we are again. Yes. Pass your exams then and get your commission. I intend to. All aboard. I better. Have you got something sensational to read on the train? Hugh. What? What is it? What? Don't stay here forever. Come back. Come back soon. Hugh stands for a long time. Long after the train has disappeared, his heart in turmoil. Then he turns and slowly makes his way back to the sanatorium. In episode two of The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann, dramatized by Robin Brooks, Hugh Casthorpe was played by Luke Thallon, James Simpson by Hugh Skinner, Dr. Crowmarsh, Sandy Grierson, Professor Jones, Richard Harrington, Claudia Civet, Genevieve Gaunt, Nurse, Kate Paul, Miss Robinson, Kezia Joseph, Marjorie and the oligarch's wife, Georgina Strawson, Stour, Ed Jones, and the narrator, was Lucy Robinson. The Magic Mountain was produced and directed by Fiona McAlpine and was an Allegra production for BBC Radio 4.